the TR of America, good Charlotte, the anthem, the Simple Plan guys are actually out here hooking fans up with their new CD, and it's going down. I'm hanging out here with lead singer Pierre. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are here to talk about what I believe may be one of the most underrated bands in all of alternative music, and that is Simple Plan. If you turn back the clock to what I consider to be the peak of human civilization, meaning the mid-2000s, and the golden era of pop punk when everyone was wearing Hurley shirts, Dicky shorts, and spiking their hair, Simple Plan has to be one of the very first bands mentioned, because they were right up there with Blank, Good Charlotte, and Sum 41. They have two multi-platinum albums and brought a ton of mainstream attention to pop punk with things like their appearance in the Olsen Twins movie, being a fixture on TRL, Total Request Live, the Scooby-Doo theme, and writing songs that to this day defined the 2000s for a whole generation of pop punk kids. A simple plan. They rock. And despite all of that, I feel like you kind of rarely hear their name mentioned on these lists of the best, most influential pop punk bands of all time. So the question is, what happened? How did they go from a struggling band of kids in the Canadian suburbs to topping the Billboard charts? And maybe most importantly, what is their lasting legacy and impact? And why don't they get the attention that, at least in my opinion, they deserve? Those are the questions that I will answer in this video. And also, this video is sponsored by Helix Sleep. Their 4th of July sale is running right now, and it is a great time to upgrade your mattress. You can get 25% off your purchase for a limited time, just check out the Helix site for more details. I've had my Helix mattress for about six months now, and honestly, I absolutely love it, but everybody is different and Helix knows that. So they made their sleep quiz to match your unique body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. And if you sleep with a partner, you can take the quiz together and find something that's a perfect compromise for both of you. I took it with my wife and based on our results, Helix matched us with their Dusk Lux mattress. My wife and I are both side sleepers who like kind of a medium mattress. So this was a perfect fit for both of us. We fall asleep much faster and just in general sleep better every night. And with your Helix sleep mattress, you get a 100 night sleep trial along with a 10 year warranty. And there are financing options as well as flexible payment plans. And Helix delivers the mattress right to your door for free within the US. It all comes rolled up in a box and it is super easy to set up yourself. Took me maybe at most five minutes. I love my Helix mattress and I think you might too. So if you are looking for a new bed, check out Helix Sleep. Their 4th of July sale is running right now and it is the perfect time to upgrade your sleep with 25% off a Helix Sleep mattress plus two free pillows. Just click the link below or go to helixsleep.com slash punk rock to find out more about this limited time offer. Pop punk truly went pop in that era in the sense of like, you guys were top of the charts and you guys were in movies. I mean, like you guys are the band in the Mary Kay and Ashley movie. Which Simple Plan was formed in 1999, but the band's origins actually go back quite a bit further than that to another band called Reset that was formed way back in 1993. Reset had a couple future members of Simple Plan in it, namely Pierre and Chuck on drums and vocals slash bass respectively. And as you can tell, their first album was actually really good. It's kind of like a little bit more skate punk version of Simple Plan. And to make a long story short, Chuck left the band. And after reconnecting with Pierre at a Sugar Ray show of all places, he recruited Pierre to sing for his new band, Simple Plan. Then they got Dave on bass. And the final lineup of Simple Plan was born in 2000. And after sending out demos to over 50 labels without getting a deal and just continuing to be basically insanely persistent, they eventually strong-armed Atlantic Records into signing them in 2001. They went into the studio and released their first album, No Pads, No Helmets, Just Balls, in March of 2002. And for context, remember that this was three years after Blink-182 kind of blew up the genre with all the small things, followed closely by Sum 41, Good Charlotte, and Newfound Glory, 
also breaking out in 2000. So Simple Plan actually was a little bit late to the party. And initially, after somewhat weak sales out of the gate, it looked like their album was probably just going to fizzle. But something changed. Their big break came with the debut single from the album, I'm Just a Kid. I'm just And thanks to their major label backing, this song was featured in a pretty popular teen movie at the time called The New Guy, starring Eliza Dushku, who was fresh off of Bring It On. And the video featured her, as well as a cameo from Tony Hawk. The song became a hit, and that gave them the boost to get out of this rut that they had been stuck in for years, of being always the opener for bigger bands like Blink and No Effects, but never being the star. And so they quickly hit the road to capitalize on the momentum from Just a Kid, supporting Green Day, Avril Lavigne and Sugar Ray, and maybe most importantly, playing the entire 2003 Warp Tour as a headliner. They also did the theme song to a new show that was rebooting the Scooby-Doo franchise, which might seem like kind of a random thing to do, but think about it. This put them in front of literally millions and millions of kids every day who would get this song stuck in their head and sing along to it for years and years and years. <laughs> And their next three singles were also hits. Addicted, I'd Do Anything, and Perfect. And on the back of all that success and a lot of hard work on their part, the album quickly went double platinum in America. Simple Plan had officially arrived as a mainstream success. They also made an appearance on the soundtrack to the 2003 Lindsay Lohan movie Freaky Friday, which on the one hand was a huge opportunity for them, but on the other hand probably didn't do much to help the perception that they were basically the pop punk band for for fifth graders. Which brings me to my next point, which is that unfortunately, as you oftentimes see with any band that gets that much success that quickly, there was a ton of backlash and hate for Simple Plan. Reviewers were not kind to their album, calling it things like a trite and derivative brand of inoffensive mall punk, harmless bubblegum pop punk for the junior high set. And if you wanted to look at message boards and forums, much, much, much worse things that I don't want to repeat here. Years later, in an interview about this point in their career, their drummer Chuck, I think, summed it up really well. We came out right as pop punk was exploding. There was a lot of pushback against all these bands. We were probably, in people's minds, the worst example of that scene, the sort of mall punk. We had kids that were into the heavier bands, the more punk rock side of Warp Tour. They gave us a lot of shit about our sound and the album and the band. You know what's funny? In our careers, a lot of times I've been somewhere and people are like, oh, I love your band. Good Charlotte. Or like, Sum 41. Or I love your song. You know, all the small... Th I'm like, yes, that's not us. <laughs> that's not us. And I'll admit, at the time, being someone that was into a lot of metal and hardcore and quote-unquote real punk, to be honest, I kind of wrote them off as well. And for me, it wasn't their music because I actually thought that was pretty good. To me, it was more about, like, the vibe that they had been put together by their label or something. Like, the fact that they had Tony Hawk in their first video and how the album had features from Mark Hoppus of Blink-182 and Joel Madden from Good Charlotte. It just felt off to me, like there was some sort of major label creation that was intended to be like a pop punk boy band. Although in reality, what I didn't know is that the reason why they had those features is because they'd been putting in the work for years. For example, they had toured with Blink and Good Charlotte before, and so they were friends with them. In hindsight, that should have been obvious to me. And if you look, even now, 20 years later, people are having that same debate about them on Reddit. And aside from that, I think a lot of the negative reaction that they got is because they were easily the most pop of the big pop punk bands. And they really did come off as a little bit more, I guess, for lack of a better word, kid-friendly than a lot of the bands in the genre. And also, as their singer Pierre said, when I listen back today, I think that record is the one where my voice sounds the most whiny and it really irks me. I find it hard to listen to. But still, like I said, even though all of that stuff sort of turned me off, the songs were actually great, and so I kept listening to the album, and it really grew on me. Honestly, it's great. They are by far the most pop of the big four pop punk bands, but I think that's actually why I like it so much. So if you're a fan of pop punk and you've never given this album a fair listen, you definitely should. It's every bit as much of a pop punk classic as Sum 41 or Good Charlotte. 
And by the way, 55% of you are not subscribed. So I would appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button now. It really helps the channel and it makes sure that you don't miss any of my videos. And speaking of the kid-friendly thing, another kind of random simple plan moment is that they weirdly ended up being a central element in the plot of the Olsen twins movie, New York Minute, where the girls skip school to go see Simple Plan in New York City and give one of their demos to the band. Packaging. Let's let's take a look. And this all led up to their second album, still not getting any, in 2004. And to kind of set the stage for this album, there's a thing called the sophomore slump, which basically refers to the thing where a lot of bands that have a really successful first album struggle to follow it up on the second one. And it certainly looked like that might be the case for Simple Plan as well. With their first album, they spent something like a year in the studio working on it, which is honestly kind of insane. Typically, that's something you might spend one, two, three months on. Whereas with the second album, they were somewhat rushed. As their drummer Chuck, who along with Pete, Pierre is one of the primary songwriters in the band put it, this record was so full of deadlines. Because of the way the schedule worked out, we had to write about 10 songs in three months. And in addition to the sort of rushed schedule, they also switched producers. This time bringing in Bob Rock, who was best known for producing the Black Album for Metallica. And so the question was, could they follow up the success of their massive first album, or would they just be another one of these bands that made a big splash on the first album and then sort of fizzled? Bob Rock hasn't really told us how he wants to proceed yet. I mean, I think we're just gonna sit down, listen to a song and just um, get some drum tones, get some sounds, like some just great guitar sounds and bass sound and just start, you know, arranging and working on the song and recording it. The first single from this album was Welcome to My Life, which to me almost feels like the more mature follow-up to I'm Just a Kid. If the first album felt kind of juvenile to some people, this one was clearly more dark, moody, and for a lack of a better word, mature. To me, it followed a very similar pattern to how bands like Green Day or Sum 41 followed up a breakthrough pop punk album with something much darker and more rock than straight up pop punk. But there were definitely familiar old school pop punk songs like Jump and Shut Up. It got overall positive reviews and it hit number three on Billboard in America. And the band proved that they had avoided the dreaded sophomore slump. Unfortunately, there were still people that wanted to show the world how punk they were by hating on Simple Plan. Most notably when somebody threw a bottle and hit Pierre in the face at their homecoming show in 2005. And it would be several more years before they put out any new music, but the band was definitely busy with several global tours as well as a few pretty interesting side hustles. Chuck and Pierre started a clothing brand called Role Model, which actually lasted for quite a while, which just seemed like kind of the thing to do if you were in a pop punk band back then. Like how the Blink guys had Macbeth, Atticus, and of course, Famous Stars and Straps. Pierre also hosted a prank show on MTV2 called Damage Control. I'm Pierre, and this is Chris. He thinks his parents are going out of town and leaving him in charge of their house. What he doesn't know is that they'll be tucked away in the neighbor's garage, watching his every move. Thanks to 28 hidden cameras we installed while he was away. And what I personally think is especially cool, they started a charity called the Simple Plan Foundation, which is funded by donations as well as a portion of ticket sales from every Simple Plan show, and has worked with a lot of other cool organizations like War Child, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and UNICEF. Which brings us to their third full length, their self-titled album in 2008, which I consider to be kind of the oddball of their catalog. And part of that, I think, is because for this one, they brought in some producers who came from the pop world. One of them was Danger, best known for being Timbaland's prodigy, and working with him on songs for artists like Nelly Furtado, Justin Timberlake, and Usher. I knew who they were from seeing them on MTV for like two years straight. They was, they was killing it. So. And the other one was Max Martin, who, as you may know, is easily the most successful producer in pop history, who's worked with basically everybody from Backstreet Boys to Celine Dion to Katy Perry. And as you might guess, that gave this album a very different flavor from pretty much anything else they've done. The first single from the album was When I'm Gone. Now we're not gonna wait. 
But aside from Pierre's emo hair during this era, what I personally find more interesting are songs like Generation. I'm sick of all this waiting and people telling me what I should be. This album is by far the most pop thing they ever did, with a lot of electronic drums and synths, and a little bit more of a darker post-punk vibe in places, almost a little bit dancey here and there, that was very much in line with what a lot of other bands were doing at the time. For example, Good Charlotte's Get Your Hands Off My Girl and AFI's December Underground. Personally, I think it's cool that they did this because I always support artists doing something different and experimenting, but at least to me, this kind of just doesn't really feel like a simple plan album and they returned with get your heart on in 2011 which brought back the proud tradition of dick jokes and their album titles and the classic pop punk sound as well as features from artists like rivers cuomo of weezer alex gaskarth of all time low and the song jet lag with natasha bedingfield which i personally think is one of their very best songs And they followed that up five years later with taking one for the team in 2016, which to me is very much a return to form. Like this really almost feels to me like a more mature version of their first album. It's just a really solid, feel good pop punk album that's honestly better than just about anything that any of the younger bands were doing in the genre at the time. I feel like they kind of came back with this one and showed everyone how it should be done. Hey! They also had a viral moment in 2020 when the I'm just a kid challenge ended up kind of just randomly trending on TikTok. As far as I'm aware, the band and their label had nothing to do with it. Getting everybody from Usher to Will Smith to Ed Sheeran to make their version of it. When you're spending every day on your own and here it goes. And after firing their longtime bassist, as well as his replacement over allegations of sexual misconduct, they released their most recent album, Harder Than It Looks, in 2022, and co-headlined a 20th anniversary tour with Sum 41. Which brings us to the last question, what is their lasting influence and impact? Well, like I said in the beginning, I think this band is extremely underrated. I mean, yes, obviously everybody knows who they are and could probably sing along to half a dozen of their songs. But what I mean is that you don't hear people bring them up as often as you do Blink, Sum 41, or New Found Glory. And honestly, that's a huge injustice. Their catalog is incredibly consistent and they've never put out anything bad in 20 years. And as far as them being like little kid punk? Well, I mean, to be honest, that's not totally wrong. They were in Scooby-Doo and Freaky Friday and the Olsen Twins movie, and their music is, in general, pretty clean PG-13 kind of stuff. But is that a bad thing? Does that make their music any less good? And aside from that, I think they deserve a lot of credit for what they did for the genre. I mean, think about it. Millions of kids watched all those movies and TV shows, and some percentage of them heard Simple Plan, and that was their introduction to the whole world of punk and metal. The Simple Plan to Whitechapel pipeline is real. And so even if you don't personally like Simple Plan or bands like them, you should still be happy that they exist because they're so good for the scene. A rising tide truly does lift all boats. And I think it's also an important reminder of just how tough toxic that mindset is. I think this quote from their drummer Chuck sums it up pretty well. At the time, the whole selling out thing was extremely taboo. You were not supposed to want to be big and popular and famous. You were supposed to be happy to be a small underground band. And we never really felt like that. We always felt like we wanted to reach people. We wanted to play in front of a lot of people. And that really resonates a lot with me because my question has always been, how many people can I get to watch my videos? How big can this thing be? Like, could I get 1 billion people to watch all my videos and discover great music? I don't know, but that's what I'm trying to do. So I have a ton of respect for what Simple Plan has done over the last 23 years. So I'm happy to see them start to get the respect that honestly, they've always deserved. And if you haven't, as soon as you're done watching this, give their catalog a listen. I think you'll be glad you did. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. Also, I wanna thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. Patrons get all my videos and podcasts early. There are members only channels in my Discord that I'm super active in. I do giveaways sometimes. And there is also a way to have me review your music. So if any of that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.